In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuler, taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Schuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your Hour of Power. Good morning, dear friends of Hour of Power. I'm so glad to see you on TVP Power Channel. Our program is bilingual broadcast. Other than original English, if your TV is equipped with night camp facility, you can watch Our Power in Cantonese. Today, Pastor Bobby Schiller shares with us how to manage our anger. Anger is dangerous. Anger can hurt people. If we don't handle our anger properly, it can destroy our lives. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Very often, we get angry with people around us for valid reasons, and that would affect the relationship with our family, colleagues, and friends. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Bobby teaches us not to ignore our feelings. We need to be honest, calmly express our feelings both to God and man. If there is something we cannot achieve, we have to say no with love, voice out our feelings honestly, and submit it to God in prayers, and entrust the outcome to God. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. We are so honored you're here today or tuned in with us this morning. The Lord has a word for you in this moment. Would you turn around and shake the hands of the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. Father, we're so thankful for all the great things that you're doing. Lord, in a world in which we, we suffer, we, we have tragedies, when we come to church and we gather like this, we can for a moment just stop and thank you for all the good things too. To not focus on what we've lost, but focus on what we have. And thank you, Lord, that our future is bright if our future has Jesus. Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen.
be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, hear the words of the Lord. Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me, I am your salvation. May all who gloat over my distress be put to shame and confusion. May all who exalt themselves over me be clothed with shame and disgrace. May those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they always say, the Lord be exalted, who delights in the well-being of his servant. My tongue will proclaim your righteousness, your praises all day long. May we as God's children move from anger to a heart of true peace. Just when you thought you knew everything about the Salvation Army, someone comes along and completely changes that perception. My guest today is Commissioner Jim Nags, along with his wife and Commissioner Carolyn. And uh, he leads the Salvation Army's work in the U.S. Western Territory, including 14 Western states, the Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. Please welcome with me Jim Nags. Hi, Jim. So when you were a kid, your mom showed you this ad, and this is kind of how you kick off your Salvation Army career. Tell me a little bit about this ad. This is really true. At 10 years old, my mother comes home and tells me and my older sister and brother, we're doing something different today. As of today, in the newspaper, I'm going to place an advertisement 
It's going to say this. Any girl in trouble or in need of a friend, call Evelyn Nags at the Salvation Army. And then she said, and I'm going to put our home phone number there, which is why I'm talking to you three. Hmm. She said, if I'm not home and you receive a call, you need to know how to answer the call. You see, Bobby, those were code words in those days, uh, in the 60s. Those were code words. Uh, any girl in trouble, that would be someone who's pregnant without a husband mm -hmm. or a family to support her, or in need of a friend, that could even be somebody who's being abused. And so she was uh, opening up sort of a hotline for the community. And it was our job to know what to do to answer the phone. Yeah, and I almost think that was almost like a boot camp for you. I mean, as a kid, you're learning what it means to help and connect with the wounds of others. How old were you? I was only 10. 10, yeah. So I'll never forget the first call. Yeah. And it was a young girl. She was 16. And she was calling from a phone booth. And she said, I'm really in trouble. Uh, my family uh, hasn't protected me. And now I'm pregnant uh, from somebody in the family. And I need, I need help. I really need help. And so my job was to take down the right information. And my mother had given us an orientation how to do that so we knew what to do. And, uh, you know, in the, in the course of that, through the years, when those calls would come through, they were also backed up by occasional weekends when a girl or a mother and children would show up at our doorstep uh, that my parents would bring home and say, okay, move out of the bedrooms. We've got company for the weekend. And these were people who were in that circumstance and who needed help. So, I mean, your, your family was basically saints. You were all saints. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, amazing. I don't think so, but uh, yeah. we, we all belong to the Salvation Army. We all belong to Jesus. Yeah. And my parents were Salvation Army ministers, showed me how to live. They showed me firsthand. I didn't have to read a manual or anything like that. And in fact, a lot of these experiences really gave you, I mean, you say it gave you, um, I would think, um, a real emphasis on the value of the individual. It absolutely did. Uh, it was only maybe a, a year later that uh, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Look, 11 years old is pretty young, but not too young to hear the voice of God. Yeah. And the God spoke to me and said, look, uh, I think I want, you to do, I, I want you to do the same thing as your parents. So here I am. Here we are. So now, and it's wonderful, and I, it's so cool that you're actually carrying on your parents' heritage on this, and, the, and of course, Salvation Army's at 150 years. This is it. It's a big anniversary. We're off to a good start. Yeah, I think that's so. great. I think so. It's great. Well, we're so grateful for you guys. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think that, one of the ways you stand out in a, in a big, you know, huge actual organization like Salvation Army is you, you've actually gotten really good with media, social media. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we have a new invention within the last four or five years called Savin TV. So it's Salvation Army Vision Network dot TV. So S A V N dot TV. Mm -hmm. In this, it's our intention to use that media to bring people to closer to God. Yeah. That's great, and you're doing it. And, uh, you know, for me, I know a lot of us, when we think of the Salvation Army, we often think of, like, you know, a guy dressed up like Santa Claus. Now they have some really cool ones. The Santa Claus is, like, rapping, That's right. you know, and there's a little red kettle. But you guys do way more than, than just the... I mean, tell us a little bit In about... In 126 countries around the world, I believe the Salvation Army does every conceivable type of constructive human service based on local need. Yeah. Salvation Army is very locally driven. So it's not like a franchise where you see the same thing in country after country. No, the, the Salvation Army in Africa is very African. The yeah. Salvation Army in Australia is very Australian. Yeah. The Salvation Army here in Anaheim is very American. So, you know, you're, you have people listening all over the world um, on television here in the church. And what do you have to say? I mean, in your ministry, we've got a lot of people here that are wounded, that are suffering. People feel angry. What are... What, what is something that you would say? I mean, if just what's, what's the thing that drives your heartbeat? God's love is for all of us. God's uh, son, Jesus, died for all of us. Amen. No matter our language, no matter our culture, no matter our circumstances, no matter our difficulty. And we can live above those circumstances if we will embrace his love and accept it for our lives. Yeah, what a great word. And, and of course, uh, you, you learn that firsthand. I just, again, what I think is so powerful is that, I mean, one of the things we can learn as Christians is that Look, look at how his family responded to suffering women, and look at how other churches responded to suffering women. It was night and day. 
And I think one of the things we can learn is that true believers, I mean, the hymn says they'll know we are Christians by our love. Right. And that is absolutely the truth, that when, like Jim or anybody else who recognizes that all of us make mistakes, and in the end, all of us need help, we need support, uh, life is difficult, it's hard, and when we do it together and we love one another and we let uh, the light of Christ shine in our hearts, we can make a big difference. Amen. And that's exactly what you're doing. That's what Salvation Army is doing. We're with you, Bobby. How can we support you? How can we support Salvation Army? Look, I think together. I think uh, let's have an intentionality to work together yeah. uh, to serve God because uh, uh, being independent isn't really the solution. We need to put, uh, put our shoulders together and work together and share uh, God's grace in powerful ways. Well, we here at Shepherd's Grove are 100% behind Salvation Army. We love you guys, and we're so thankful that the world that the world has a Salvation Army, and we know it's a better place because you're in it. We're Thanks so grateful, so Jim, that you are here. Let's give him a hand and thank him again for all that you're doing, Jim. We appreciate you so much. Well, our music guest today is Mandy Pinto and her friends. So thank you, Mandy, for being here. We love you, and we're looking forward to hearing you play. Let's give her a hand.
Well, good morning. We're so glad that you're watching. Thanks for joining us today. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby Schuler. I respond to everyone at least once. Would you stand with me? We're going to say this confession together. Hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving God's love. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. So last night, I went on a daddy-daughter date with Haven, my daughter. She is five. And we went and saw Disney's Inside Out. And let me just say, this movie is unreal good. You have to go see it. Uh, I recommend it to everyone. And it was so great because as we're sitting, oh, I know, she's so sweet. I didn't even tell her to do this. She just does it. Like, it's her film. We, uh, we went to Inside Out last night, and it was great because I, I love the story. The story is about getting into the mind of a, of a girl and seeing that her whole life is run by five emotions, and each emotion is its own character. It's like sadness, anger, uh, disgust, fear, and joy. And joy kind of runs the ship, but these other four emotions sort of help joy. And I think it was such a great story because what was weird is fear anger, disgust, and the others, the, what you think were bad emotions, were actually good guys. That was the thing that I thought was most creative about the film, that these were good guys that were trying to help Joy, who was the main character inside the little girl's head, succeed at making the girl have a happy life. And I feel like that's a great place to start. If you've seen the film, um, it helps. If you haven't, don't worry. But just to begin by saying this, today we're talking about anger in particular, and anger as it finds its place in the Psalms, if you're a passionate person, if you're an artist, you know, uh, it's very likely that at times you can get very angry. And what we want to talk about today is anger in general. And what the Bible teaches us about anger, that anger is just what it is. It's just a normal part of human living. Anger is not good, and anger is not bad. I find that many people, when they teach on anger... They tend to lift it up like it's this really great thing and you need to be really angry and you need to tell people like it is. And then there are other people that say anger is evil, don't ever have anger, just shove it down. And, and so there are these sort of two philosophies and both of them are wrong. Uh, anger, in fact, is dangerous. Anger can hurt people, it can wound people. If it's out of control, it'll poison your life. And yet shoving anger down is also, in the long run, going to make you an angrier person. So we're going to talk about that today. All of us experience anger, right? And all of us experience it nearly every day. You experience anger at your cell phone. You experience anger when your Wi-Fi isn't working or your car doesn't start. Uh, you experience when, anger when you slap the microwave or when you, know, you ordered your Oreos in the vending machine and it's stuck by that little thing and it's not coming down and you don't have another dollar. And then there are other things that anger us too. I mean, uh, we get angry you know, very often with the people that we love and for, for valid reasons. Sometimes we get terribly angry, and we ought to, when something tragic happens and we see it in the news. So, so feeling anger is a normal part of human life. It happens when we feel that justice has been broken, when we feel that a boundary has been crossed, and we experience it every day, and many of us just don't know what to do with it. We don't. I remember one of the things, I was trying to think, well, what was one of those angry feelings I ever had? Han and I are driving in a car, and we're about to get on the 405 North coming from the Irvine Spectrum. As we're going, we're about to go onto the on-ramp, and there are these two guys, they're right next to us, and they're going through the bike lane, right, to pass everybody. I don't even see them. I'm like turning onto the freeway, and I cut them off from their bike lane, whatever thing, on accident, didn't even see them. And of course, they pull up next to me as we get on the 405 going north. And they roll down their window and they start screaming and giving me the great American bird. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was, you know, and, and they're hollering at me. And of course, I'm Irish, you know, I'm half Dutch, but I'm half Irish too. So I was not allowed, I was not about to just sit there and let them just say that. <laughs> you know, this was eight years ago, so I, I was much more of a, an angry person then, honestly. So I rolled down the window and I just started mocking them. Like, <laughs> like, really trying to incite. 
And so that makes them more angry. So, and Hannah's going, just go, just go. And I'm like, no, this is wrong. It was their fault. You can't drive a car in the bike lane. You know, and so I'm feeling all justified. Everybody's angry, everybody's angry. So what do they do? All of a sudden, the, the guy on the passenger side, he grabs a, wa a bottle of water. Keep in mind, we're on the freeway going like 70 miles an hour. And he throws it, and a pretty good shot. Through the air, with all the wind and everything, and it comes through my window. Remember, both of our windows are open because we're yelling at each other. And it comes, and like, you know, my cat rag reflexes, it was like, it was just like the Matrix. It was like, mama. Yeah. You know, and it just went zooming by. And I was like, yeah, how about that? <laughs> and we're going onto another freeway, and we're starting to split like this. And they're like, ah, <laughs> And I look over at Hannah, and she's crying. And I realized the bottle of water popped her right in the eye. And I was like, oh, no, she's crying. And her eye, she's going like this with her eye. And then I was like, Dick. And I looked back, and now they're going. And I'm like, no! <laughs> and thinking, I will find you, you know? And poor Hannah got like a little, like, yeah, she got a black eye from getting, and I, I can't, for a year, I was angry, it had to be a year, that I was angry about this one story. I had so many fantasies of things that I could have done, you know. <laughs> My favorite was the idea that I had, when they threw the water bottle off, I'd been like, poof, and caught the bottle, and then opened it and drunk it <laughs> as I kind of got out of the freeway. That was my dream. If I could have done that, it would have, it would have, I could have just died. I would have been the ultimate for me. It would have been the greatest experience of my life. So this is what happens, right? All of us have experienced anger, and we think about stories and ways like this that you feel violated, you feel like somebody crossed the line. You, you can obsess about it, it can seem, and this, this can be about people that are dead. Some of us are still angry at dead people. And so it doesn't matter because regardless of what happened, Many of us, we feel these emotions, like, I don't know those guys' names, I'll never see them again. So we feel, we feel anger very often when a line is crossed. And what I want to say is this, that anger is like a headache. It's from Dallas Willard. Anger is like a headache in the sense that it doesn't necessarily help you or hurt you as much as it does as pain. Let me explain. Pain is good. When you touch a frying pan, it's good that you experience pain because if you don't have pain, you're going to lose your hand, right? In the same way, anger, or like a headache, anger tells you something's wrong. If you feel anger in your body, something's wrong, and you need to address it. Every time. Anger is such an important emotion that has a big effect, especially on the people that have to do life with us, that have to work with us, or sleep with us, or eat with us, that, that anger needs to be dealt with in the right way. Psalms teaches us what to do with anger. Now, I'm actually very sad that sometimes most churches only pick the happy psalms. You know, only like a quarter of the psalms are actually happy. Most of them are psalms of lament of some kind or another. And many of those psalms are psalms of anger. God, I'm angry at you. I mean, that was Hannah's reading today. It was, God, fight those who fight me. Lord, take up your spear against those who take the spear against me. See that they're dashed. See that they're put to shame. There are all of these psalms that seem, to us, especially as Christians, they seem violent, they seem angry, they seem, you know, some, some of them horrible, the things that they say. You think, how can this be God's word? How can something so angry, even hateful and vitriol, how can that be God's word? And the answer is this. The word is catharsis. Everyone say catharsis. Catharsis is the Greek word for cleansing. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But the reason the psalms of anger and all the psalms of lament exist are for the purpose of catharsis. Of taking an emotion that you feel and not pretending like it's not there and not diverting it to someone, some innocent person, right, who happens to cross your path, but bringing it to God. Bringing your anger to God. Like, God, I'm angry! Right? There is something about the psalms of anger that give us a place to bring our real anger before the Lord and say, Lord, I wish they were dead. And many of us, we say, no, you can't think that. Well, you already think it. It's already in there. And the point is that when we feel emotions of violence or that we want to get back at someone or we want vindication, 
We shouldn't ignore it. We should bring it to God in prayer. Bring it to God in prayer. But if you have been violated in some way, you can bring it to God in anger instead of shoving it down. There's actually something very healthy about it. The word is catharsis. Everybody say, catharsis. Catharsis. It, this comes from Aristotle. Aristotle was really curious why in Greek drama, tragedy was so popular. In Greek tragedy, you, you, every Greek play in Aristotle's day in ancient Greece broke down into two types. It was comedy or tra tragedy. That's why you have those two masks. One is weeping and one is laughing, right? And the most popular of the two was actually tragedy, not comedy. And people loved going to see tragedies. Just, they loved to see people's lives just get destroyed. <laughs> and Aristotle sat back and asked this question, why do people like tragedy so much? And he said, the reason is this. Because it aligns, it, it gives them an opportunity to process through their own tragedy. When I go to the theater as an ancient Greek man and I watch a tragedy, I remember my own tragedy and my own losses. And what he says is, is like, experiencing a real tragedy is too close to process. But just going off into the woods and thinking about it is too far. When you actually see a narrative, you see a character that you empathize with, you actually re-experience re in a weird way your own tragedy, but in a way that feels safe so that you can process it. I think this is one reason why today films are so popular, is because we have not done a good job of our own emotional formation. We haven't done a good job of really navigating self-discovery, especially men. And we haven't often been given the tools that we need to work through tragedy and suffering. And many of us, we just shove it down. And what movies do is they, in a weird way, allow us to weep. And so that's what catharsis is. Catharsis is the ability to re-experience a tragedy at a safe distance, but still be close to it. And that is, that is what is happening in the Psalms. The Psalms are inviting you, now that you're angry about something and it happened a while ago, maybe a, a few hours or a few days ago, or even a year ago, Psalms allows you to go, God, I am really angry about that. I'm really, really angry about that. And then you finish by just saying, but I trust you and I praise you and I thank you. There's something cathartic about the rhythm of the psalms. Because the psalms of anger aren't just angry. They're not just angry. They always finish with something like saying, I, but still, I trust you and hallelujah. All the psalms say, I'm angry, but I trust you. Hallelujah. And that is the rhythm of the Christian. You know, as Christians, we're like, how do we reconcile the psalms of violence and anger with the nonviolence of, of Jesus and his rabbinic teaching? When Jesus teaches us to turn the cheek and love our enemies, how do, we, how do we reconcile those two? And the two are not only reconcilable, they're harmonizing. We can't be the kind of people that love our enemies if we don't process our anger the right way. Jesus loved the Psalms. He sang the Psalms. He quoted them all the time. And, the, and one of the ways that we can be less angry people is by singing and praying angry prayers. Isn't that funny? By bringing our anger before God and not just pretending like, it's not there. I know many of you are saying, Bobby, I'm already peaceful. You know, I'm not an angry person. I'm really not. And uh, I just want to ask you, how did you feel the last time a guy cut in front of you in <laughs> line at the bank? Many of us are way more angry than we know. Many of you are angrier than you know or think. See, we think of angry people as those who are in a rage, and they are. But many of us, if we feel things swirling in our heart, that's still anger. It's just bottled up. Think of it like a pressure cooker. Maybe it's not a good thing. Um, how many of you have seen the movie Anger Management? Very good movie. Very funny movie. I don't, I don't recommend movies here because, you know, I never know what the language is going to be. But at any rate, it's Adam Sandler and uh, Jack Nicholson. And uh, in the story, Adam Sandler's this guy who um, is constantly being run over by people. They're always taking advantage of him. And, and he's always just a doormat. You know, he just takes it day after day after day. And this psychotherapist comes by court order to help him through his anger. And at first it's an irony because he seems like the least angry guy in the world. But Jack Nicholson's job, and this is what makes it very funny, is to, to find a way to get Adam Sandler to completely explode, to show how angry he is. And many of us are that way. We have lots and lots of stuff going on on the inside, and we just do our best 
to pretend it's not there. Many of you are angrier than you think. And you tend to lash out at things. And so when the guy cuts in front of you at the bank, what do you do? I mean, it doesn't happen that often. I have a guess, okay? This is conjecture. My guess is that when you're standing in line, 10% of you are going to say something to him. Hey, excuse me, the line is back there, <laughs> right? 10% of you are going to do that. 10%, another 10% of you are not even going to notice. You're just going to be like, oh, did the line get longer? <laughs> I don't care. Who cares? That's the dream. That's where we want to be, okay? 80% of you are like this. Right? Maybe you, there's a, another person in line or the person behind you and you just kind of like. <laughs> right? So most of the time, when that person cuts in line, we feel angry, but we don't do anything, right? So what's the response? I'm a grown up. I feel very angry that they cut in line in front of me at the bank. But you know what? Just going to, just going to, you know. And what I want to say is, in the end, someone cutting in front of you in line is not a big deal. It's not a big deal. 90% of us don't feel that way. It is a big deal. It's not fair. <laughs> Lines are made for a reason. We don't want to fall into anarchy. We need rules, Bobby. <laughs> it's really just not a big deal. But for most of us, because we're already angry, an experience like that, I want you to hear this. You're probably already angry when that person cut in front of you in line about stuff you forgot about. You're angry about stuff you've forgotten about. So what happens is when you're in line, let's say you, you leave, you go, and there's going to be another 30 minutes where you're thinking about, you know, I should have just said something. You know, I should have gotten the teller. You know, I should, and just, you go over and over in your head about, how can they just do that? How can you just cut in line? It's not like, just not care about anybody, you know? So we, a lot of times we end up swirling these thoughts in our head when, when, we fe when somebody crosses some boundary with us. And here's what I want you to hear. Every time you feel angry at somebody over something that's kind of petty, when they cross the line, the, 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 what feels like a big anger that you feel towards that person, it's a lot bigger than it needs to be because it's connected to the, all the other times that people cross the line with you. You hear what I'm saying? Every time we feel angry about a small thing like that, it's connected to all the other times people hurt us. You may not be thinking, but it's in your heart, the time when you were bullied, the, the thing that your parents, your brother said or did to you when somebody stole something from you, when you lost your job unfairly. And because we don't process those emotions well, we very often just store them. And so when somebody does something like cuts in front of us in line or cuts us off on the road, it's not just about that. Everything else goes whoo, like this. In other words, and if you have a pen, write this down. The object of your anger is usually not the source of your anger. This is absolutely true if you're angry at an inanimate object. All right? <laughs> if you are really, really angry at your printer, uh, <laughs> It's, there's something else going on in the inside. You know, it's like, an, it, actually, at a comedy, this comedy from the 90s, Office Space, they bring the, guy, the three guys, you know, they're leaving their job, and they, when they leave, they take this printer that they hate out into a field, and they just start beating it with <laughs> baseball bats. But all of us intuitively know that it's not about the printer, right? Them beating up that printer is about them having, a, you know, a terrible paycheck, they, they're... They don't feel like they're going anywhere in their lives. They hate their jobs. They, they didn't accomplish their dream. So it's, there's all this other angry stuff that's associated with this inanimate object. We can all agree on that, right? That if you're really, really angry at an inanimate object, there's something else going on that's more than just that object, right? What if the emotions of anger you feel towards your wife or husband or your kids or some of your colleagues, what if the... What if the anger you feel towards them is more about some of the stuff that's going on inside of you. 
than it is about what they did to you? What if there's a lot going on in your body and you never thought you were an angry person, but these things are able to make you feel angry and miserable? We've not done a good job of bringing our anger to God. See, that's the, that is the thing. Uh, Henry Nowen called it praying with clenched fists. And I want to talk about that. Um, and we'll just finish with this. That if we want to be the kinds of people that want to journey from an angry heart to a peaceful heart, we become the kind of people that everywhere we go, we just bring the temperature down. We're just a peaceful presence. If we want to be that kind of people, we need to do three things. We need to be honest first. Second, we need to submit to God. Third, we need to maintain good boundaries. If you do those three things as a regular rhythm of your life, you will watch as your anger begins to dissipate. One, got to, number one, we got to be honest about it with God and with others. Number two, we got to submit to God with that anger. And number three, we have to maintain good boundaries. Number one, honesty. Recognize that when you feel angry, that that's exactly what it is. And just give it voice. Don't gossip, don't triangulate, but be honest about it, especially if it's with someone you love. If you're, most of the times the anger that you feel is with somebody you live with or work with. So the, the anger that you feel with these people that you gotta do life with, it's important that you don't just shove it down, but with calm, you know, calm, you talk to them. Now, men, if you're, if you're a man, turn the volume up right now, all right? I need you to hear this. When men get angry, everybody does this, but especially men. When men get angry at their wives, one of the most common reactions is to stonewall. Okay? To stonewall. If you're angry or she's angry, you're both angry, and you say, I don't want to talk about this. Conversation over. Do whatever you want. This is stonewalling. Now, ladies, men do this, or people do this, because they're out of energy and they don't know how to respond. But in truth, the psychologist, I just read an article that for women who, who have a greater sensitivity or actually healthier with their emotions, want to process this, when you stonewall, it's the same experience as you feel when you're humiliated. Women being stonewalled is like what men feel when they feel humiliated. There's something humiliating about it. In that, now that doesn't mean you have to always talk about your emotions right away, but if you need a space, you need to just say, I, I, I'm out of gas, I need 15 minutes, I love you, I wanna talk about this, but I can't talk about it right now. That's not stonewalling. That's a loving thing to do, whether it's your, your husband or your wife. But don't stonewall. You've got to be honest. You've got to do the hard work, whether it's with your spouse, your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, colleagues, people you work with. You've got to do the hard work of processing your emotions. You want sensitivity, love, and wisdom, um, but don't stonewall, don't bury, and, and process. And if it's somebody you can't process with, find a soul friend or even a therapist. And you'll find that the honesty is such a great place to begin to be a less angry person. So number one, be honest. Number two, um, uh, just bring it to God. Submit to God. So Henry Nouwen called this praying with clenched fists, and this is the exact same thing you see in the Psalms, where a fist, like look at a fist, right? A fist is a symbol of anger and violence, but it's also a symbol of holding on to something, right? And so when we pray, we come into our prayer closet, Lord, I'm angry! I'm angry at my boss. I'm angry at my husband. I'm angry at my wife. I'm angry at my kids, my parents, right? I'm angry at the guy who cut me off. I'm angry. And if you feel it, just say it. Lord, I'm angry. But where you want to be when you finish is you, you, want, to you want to finish your prayer with an open hand. And I would even say, do, do that with your body. Where you say, Lord, I'm angry. I feel like people keep, you know, crossing me, hurting me. But Lord, I trust you and I praise you, and I thank you. Amen. That's not going to fix it, but it's going to help. It's going it's to give voice and prayer to your anger so that you're not just bearing it. Dallas Willard called this abandoning outcomes to God. You're saying, Lord, here are my outcomes. And finally, number three, boundaries. We have to become the kinds of people in a world that is constantly demanding our attention we have to be able to say no with love. Many of you are saying yes 
when you don't have a yes to give. That is less loving than just saying no with love. And if you have people in your life that you can't say no to, you need to get to a place where either you can or you can have a straight talk conversation with them and say, I just feel like I can't say no to you in a bad way. See, if you can't say no to someone, you also can't say yes to them as a believer. And too many of us, because we want affection and we have all this ego and we want to help everyone and do everything, we say yes to everything. And, some t and that leads to an angry life. You have to be able to say no with love sometimes. And you just have to search your own heart. You have to explore. Do, do I feel really angry about this or that? And if you do, you're probably saying yes to too many things. Friends, anger is a normal part of life. If you feel really angry, congratulations, you're a human being. You know, all of us, we feel it, but we have to remember that we let our anger get out of hand. It's going to destroy and hurt our lives and the lives of those we live with. Let's become the kind of people that deal with our emotions the right way by bringing it to God and bringing it to soul friends that can walk with us and empathize with us. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, bow your heads with me. I want to give everyone here an opportunity to come to Jesus. Today is a great day to become a Christian. And I just want to invite you. You know, some of you, you're listening today and you say, you know, this is interesting. I want to be a student of Jesus. I want to be saved and I want to invite you. And so no matter who you are, if you're in this church, you're watching on TV, I want you to pray this prayer with me. And if you do, you've become the first step to being a disciple of Jesus. Say, Father in heaven, forgive me of my sin. Thank you for Jesus and for his work that he did for me on the cross. I want to be your student. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and save me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, friends, again for being here today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And you're coming in and you're going out. And you're lying down and in your rising up. In your labor and in your leisure. In your laughter and in your tears. Until you come to stand before Jesus on that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. And we Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. Thanks for watching Hour of Power. Anger is dangerous. Anger can hurt people. If we don't handle our anger properly, it can destroy our lives. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Very often, we get angry with people around us for valid reasons. And that would affect the relationship with our family, colleagues and friends. In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Bobby teaches us not to ignore our feelings. We need to be honest, calmly express our feelings both to God and man. If there is something we cannot achieve, we have to say no with love, voice out our feelings honestly, 
and submit it to God in prayers, and entrust the outcome to God. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. God loves you, and see you next week on TVB Pearl.